Muy buenas. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all. And I'm happy to welcome all of you to the conference. We're inaugurating today the Catedra del Prado 2016. Professor Reinhard Falkenberg is our distinguished speaker. As you know, the Cathedra is the most important activity carried out by the Study Center at the Prado Museum. And as of its first edition back in 2009, it has, we believe, consolidated and it has become a very important meeting point for art lovers in Spain. This is possible thanks to the sponsorship initially of Mutua Madrilena, the foundation Mutua Madrilena, and that is in fact what more recently has been um, taken over by the foundation Amigos del Prado, Friends of the Prado. The Cathedra conjoins conferences Thursdays and seminars on Fridays, and it fulfills a double mission. On the one hand, it allows the public to become familiar with the issues in the uh, history of art with uh, true specialists, and on the other hand, it allows young students, young professionals, to become familiar with methodologies that do not always find their way to the university classroom setting. Over 100 grant holders have benefited from this initiative carried out by the Catedra del Prado. This year, of course, the artistic event in Spain, in Europe, is the commemoration of the quincentenary of the passing of Hieronymus Bosch. The museum has carried out a number of activities surrounding the exhibition, which premiered in the summer. And Dr. Falkenbohr's Cathedra, his uh, series of lectures addressing Bosch and Brujo, considered the second Bosch, is doubtless the best possible achievement that we could aspire to. This is a very ambitious program indeed. We like to say, that this is the icing on the cake. That's how we like to uh, define it. So we have, uh, I think, selected the world's leading specialist. Dr. Falkenberg is more than familiar with the works of these two artists, and his expertise is going to allow us to understand, in a novel way, understand, as I say, the new approach that we might have to do vis-a-vis -vis these two outstanding painters. Dr. Falkenberg is the Flying Dutchman in person. He has taught in the Netherlands, in the US, in Germany, and now, now over the past uh, few uh, years in Abu Dhabi. Professor Falkenberg is well known to art lovers the world over because he has participated very intensely first in the preparation of the catalog for the exhibition this current exhibition, but he has also played an absolutely stellar role in the idea, the original inception of uh, Bosch and the, the gardens. So what we want to do now is focus on Bosch, focus on Brochel, and focus, if you will, on how to achieve a new playing field of knowledge. So a very warm welcome indeed to Reinhard Falkenberg, thank you very much, Professor, and his wife, Dr. Joanna Klanke, who is also with us today, who is uh, going to be honoring us with her presence, has also been of tremendous assistance in, uh, in contributing to the Bosch program. And of course, thanks to our distinguished audience. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Hopefully, each one of the six master classes or master conferences which we have um, prepared for the program are going to be interesting. And congratulations to the grant holders. Congratulations to all of you who have successfully uh, been granted the award. Congratulations, as I say. And finally now, thanks to the Fundación Amigos del Museo del Prado, the Foundation of Friends of the Prado Museum. Thank you for backing the museum in this very, very telling and relevant academic activity. And a round of applause, please, for Carlos Zurita, Duke of Soria, who is now going to briefly address us. Thank you very much.
Mr. President, Mr. Director, ladies and gentlemen, as president of the Fundación Amigos del Museo del Prado, Friends of the Prado Museum Foundation, I am delighted to participate today in the opening session of the Catedra 2016. This uh, year, as we know, it is going to delve into the works of two absolutely essential artists, Hieronymus Bosch and Peter Brojo. Our institution is honored and this year, again, calls all of us together. This is one of the main lines of action of the center of studies of the museum. The cathedra of the museum allows us to once again comply with our mandated objective, which is to reach out to specialized audiences and to a more general audience alike. It couldn't be otherwise. I need to thank, of course, the president of uh, the Board of Trustees, Jose Pedro Perez Yorca, Miguel Zugasa, the director thereof. Thank you, gentlemen, for allowing us to play a role, a leading role in this project. And thank you also for allowing us to make good on the trust you place in us. Our sincere thanks for your ongoing support. Also, congratulations are due to Professor Reindert Falkenburg, Professor, thank you very much for having fleshed out this increasingly and incredibly interesting project. And to Miguel Falomir, Assistant Director of uh, Research and Investigation at the Museum, congratulations for nurturing this project and for turning this project into the meeting point for all of the persons who wish to delve into the contents of the Prado Museum collections. And finally, my acknowledgement also is due to all of the friends of the museum, especially those who are with us today. Your donation, your loyalty, allow us to carry out important projects such as the one we are introducing now. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much. Good afternoon to all. I'm happy to welcome all of you to this sixth edition of the Catedra del Prado, the Prado Conference Series, which I think has uh, had uh, outstanding experts, Philip de Montebello the first, Salvatore Setti, Manola Mena, Jonathan Brown, and just a few months ago, the very charming Elizabeth Cropper. So the time has come now to inaugurate the sixth cathedra. The previous cathedra holders addressed different and diverse issues, which were perhaps more akin to their intellectual concerns or their research. This is the first time that we actually had the idea of linking the issue at hand with a specific event, as referred to by the director. And of course, it had to be to commemorate the quincentenary of Bosch's passing and the absolutely outstanding exhibition which uh, was housed at the Prado. Many things have happened. Unfortunately, there have been some very odd arguments about authorship have perhaps made headlines too much, but this is not what we're going to be talking about. What we're trying to do here is respond to two ongoing comments which I heard time and again from the mouths of visitors to the exhibition. On the one hand, this, this complaint of not having understood the essential uh, tips to understand the works of Bosch himself. And then surprise, a positive, a happy surprise in the face of discovering an outstanding landscape artist. So these are the ideas that make me think that who better than Professor Falkenberg to respond to those questions. I am not going to uh, give you any information about his background because you have his CV in uh, the documentation you've received, but we are convinced that he is the man who will allow us to incisively penetrate and recover all of those cultural and religious keys that open the door to Bosch, because at the end of the day, this is indeed what is going to allow us to better understand Bosch and his work. Some of his contributions are well known, 
some of them uh, I'm sure he'll be returning to. For instance, that interpretation of the triptych of the Garden of Earthly Delights as a conversation piece. Well, there's no doubt that this opens up a completely new horizon in the understanding of the painter. And we could say the same about landscapes. I would like to remind all of you of how very, very important, how very important the publication of the monograph that uh, Patini devoted uh, to, devoted to Patini by Professor Falkenberg. Who better, who better to focus on that vision, that very broad spectrum vision, to understand what it is that truly counts when studying Bosch. So, Professor Falkenberg, you have the floor. Thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a real honor for me to be here, uh, to have been invited to the sixth version of the Catedra del Prado. I feel honored. Um, and um, it's also a joy for me to be here uh, at the Prado Museum talking about um, some of the artists that are dear to my heart. Um, the idea for me uh, in this Catedra del Prado series is to start with Geronimus Bosch and to end with Bosch. Um, and in the meantime, as if this is an arc, connect Bosch and Breugel through issues of landscape and landscape representation. Today, I will start by focusing on, especially Geronimus Bosch, a little bit Peter Breugel, and look at them from the notion of the book of nature. When one thinks of what connects the works of Geronimus Bosch and Peter Bruegel the Elder, the first thing that um, often comes to mind is their common interest in the representation of devils and demons, of diablerie or devilries. Bosch is generally considered as the, to be the initiator of the genre in early Netherlandish painting. Bruegel, in his own times, was called even the second Bosch because of the series of engravings he made of the seven deadly sins, which he situated in hell-like landscapes that abound in Bosch or Bosch-like devilries. But there is also a tradition of art historical scholarship that defines the relationship between these painters, Bosch and Bruegel, in terms of the emergence of landscape painting as a separate genre in Northern Renaissance art. World landscape is the term art historians have used since more than a century to coin this invention, for which Bosch is said to have given a main impulse in paintings such as the Hainwain triptych and the Epiphany triptych, a tradition which culminates in Peter Bruegel's famous paintings of the series of the seasons. This is one of the five extant paintings belonging to that series. Such works, it is argued in art historical literature, are the first in Western art that represent the visible world in all its natural geographical diversity as a subject in its own right. But there is also a third strain of scholarship not on devilries, not on world landscape, but a third strain of scholarship, which actually starts in the 16th century, and which maintains that both Bosch and Bruegel visualized for the first time, perhaps, a person's inner world, ranging from the realm of dreams and visions, such as can be seen in Bosch's Garden of Earthy Lights, to Bruegel's representations of such mental states as anxiety, mental blindness, stupidity, as well as man's inner spiritual and moral values, or the lack thereof. In the series of lectures I'm offering in the Catedra del Prado, we will take an integrated look at these different aspects of world in the works by these monumental figures in Northern art of the later 15th and early 16th centuries. Surrounded as they are by the pictorial traditions and inventions of a number of other important artists, such as Joachim Patinier, 
all of whom are extremely well represented here in this museum. We will take a close look at different notions of world or in the works of Bosch, Bruegel, and their contemporaries, not only in the way these works visualize, reflect, and evoke the visible and invisible world, or worlds, but also in the way they are, these works, these, these paintings are active agents, almost like actors, almost like machine, machines. A notion that will be underlying our focus on the relationship between the work of art and the viewer. Let us begin with the notion of world landscape. That is, the representation of the visible world in the work of Geronimus Bosch, Peter Bruegel, and their contemporaries. I will not dwell on the vast literature that both Bosch's and Bruegel's works have produced in this respect, but approach the idea of the representation of the visible world in their works from an almost, strangely enough, entirely neglected perspective. One that reveals this world to be connected to many worlds beyond the late medieval version of the multiverse, so to speak. In traditional art historical discourse, the notion of world landscape comes with the claim that the representation of the visible world, already in Bosch's paintings, detached itself from religious connotations, both in terms of religious meaning and or relig religious function of the image. It is said, traditionally, to reflect a fundamentally horizontal perspective of the world in the sense that the viewer is supposed to enjoy and understand the representation of the surrounding world for its own intrinsic worldly values, even if these values are negatively connoted, such as greed, and valued for their aesthetic qualities, disconnected from the traditional vertical bind of the world to a metaphysical realm and the divine eye. The Heywin triptych, well known to probably all of you, exemplifies, so it seems, this new secular world concept. You have the tiny figure of Christ hovering almost lost in the air above a bright world landscape, thematizing the utterly human impulse to acquire material goods at any cost even at the cost of your own life. This seems to offer a, offer a perfect illustration of this disconnectedness of the physical and the metaphysical world. This painting seems to represent a radical break with the traditional notion of this interconnectedness, which was still illustrated actually in Bosch's own time, such as in this well-known uh, book, produced by a German author, Hartmann Schädel. It was called The World Chronicle and published in 1493. Here you clearly see on the left that the Earth is at the center of a cosmos that entails many concentric realms of material and immaterial beings, angels and so forth, culminating in the figure of God, Potocrator, at the very top. God, the Almighty, who has created and is still governing in this image, and is still governing all of his creation. Shadow's World Chronicle is entirely in line, as you see compared to the image on the right, is entirely in line with medieval cosmology. And it is relevant to point to this strikingly different tradition, different from the Heywin triptych, so it seems, because Bosch actually knew Schädel's richly illustrated book, judging from the fact that he represented a couple of trees and he took them from two woodcuts um, from the uh, book of uh, Schädel, from the World Chronicle by Schädel. So did he just took the motif or did he actually, and did he actually had a different worldview from Schädel? It's a valid question. So one starts to wonder whether this idea of Bosch representing a secular horizontal concept of world 
actually is correct. As a matter of fact, the exterior of the Garn of Earth Delights bespeaks very much of a vertical relationship between the world and God. A relationship in which the world is dependent on God. One starts to wonder if this idea of the separation of this world and the other world is correct. As a matter of fact, this image shows God the Father in the act of creating the world. Here you see God the Father here, a, a detail. A ray of light is emerging from his mouth, you can clearly see that, with the globe and the earth at the same moment hovering in the cosmos below God. The Latin text here at the top of the painting, which is taken from the Psalms, makes this creative act of God explicit. It reads, and I'll translate in English, he spoke, God spoke, and it was made. He commanded, and it was created. In some versions, it is translated as, and it stood fast. These words occur in two psalms, Psalm 32 and Psalm 148, which, interestingly, both urge men and women, even the entire world, to sing song of praise to God the Creator and the Lord of the world. I just give you a few lines of citation. Psalm 32 reads, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap. He laid upon the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe for him. For he spoke, and it was done. It was created. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Psalm 148 says, Praise him, you heavens of heavens, you waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. Again, this. And then you have a long series of uh, evocations for praise. Praise the Lord from the earth, from the earth. You dragons and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and vapor, vapor, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and hills. Fruitful trees and cedars, beasts and cattle, creeping things, flying fowl, birds, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the Lord. There is no doubt in this psalm what it wants to say. That is, the entire earth and all that is created is encouraged to celebrate God's, God's majesty. And as if to confirm this divine-centric words, Bosch has designed the image of the creator in conformity with the iconographic tradition of God in majesty, which portrays the Pantocrator, the ruler of the entire world, with a book in his hands proclaiming that he is the Alpha and Omega. So the question then emerges, are there other signs in Bosch's painting that would endorse this divine-centric, divine focus, this divine-centric perspective? In order to address this question, let us turn, into, turn to now the interior of the triptych. So when one opens the wings of the triptych, the interior of the globe becomes visible and a world landscape opens for the viewer. The, the, ex, the exterior shows the world, and so the world opens into its interior. The left panel represents more specifically the Garden of Eden, while the central panel, because of the extension of the geography of the left panel, offers some kind of paradisiacal landscape. So here you see that this type of landscape, of course, it continues this type of landscape. So it is as if the, the, the Garden of Eden continues into the, the central panel. The right panel, on the other hand, depicts a distinctly different infernal region, as which the exact nature and location of which is, is enigmatic, is unknown. Is, is this hell? Is this an infernal landscape? What exactly is it that we are seeing? 
I will leave a more in-depth discussion of this highly complex painting, actually for the last lecture in the series, and concentrate for now on the general question, whether we are dealing in the interior with a purely horizontal representation of the world in its apparent course from the beginning of time to the end of time, or with a more cosmic model of the world in accordance with the exterior? Is there a relationship between the interior and the exterior? While the figure of the creator, now in the shape of Christ the Son, oops, here. So while the figure of the creator, now in the shape of Christ the Son, takes pride of place surrounded by Adam and Eve in the foreground of the left panel, the creation scene as such is rather marginalized within the composition of the triptych as a whole. The painting is visually dominated by a huge number and enormous variety of smaller figures, naked men and women, white and black, animals belonging to known and unknown, regular and exotic species, miscellaneous creatures combining anthropomorphic and zoomorphic features, as well as strange plants, phantasmal rocks, and hybrids of organic and inorganic matter. Do these creatures praise their creator? As the psalm says, hardly so. Do they stand fast, as the psalm says, in their identity as divinely ordained beings? Not really. Animals such as the one creeping out of the pond behind the creation scene cannot be reconciled with any known species. To say that they belong to nature as we know it, as created by God, and contribute to a, a sense of world landscape as a pleasurable aesthetic category is also not truly convincing. What then is the true nature of this world and how should we look at it? Now, one point of departure is the notion of mirabilia, wonders. Several art historians have pointed out that quite a few animals represented in the Garden of Earthy Delights, the pearls and precious stones from which the towering structures in the background of the Garden of Earthy Delights are made, the complex, phantasmal architecture of these structures, the acrobats that climb on, on top of them, the hybrid creatures that populate land and sky, the exotic fruits that are visible everywhere, that all of this, all of these motifs and more can be called wonders. Wonders actually in, the, in a very specific late medieval understanding of the word. Especially if we understand wonders to refer to uh, a type of, of books, type of manuscripts that were called, we now call bestiaries, a kind of encyclopedia, which contains all kinds of knowledge of the natural world and that were, that represented images and described in text, the stones, the plants, the animals, etc. I mentioned just a few of those very important and well-known to late medieval viewers, well-known uh, uh, manuscripts. You have Thomas Cantempré's De Natura Rerum. You have Vincent of Beauvais' Speculum Maior. Speculum, keep this in mind, the term. You have Bartholomew's Anglicus De Proprietatibus Rerum, which also appeared in a Dutch translation at the time of Bosch, by the way. And actually, a Dutch version of this, this encyclopedia called Der Naturblume on the Flowers of Nature. These were all very influential encyclopedic repositories of knowledge, summe sums of knowledge, compiled in the 13th century, which contain descriptions and illustrations of the same creatures actually that occur in the Garden of Earthly Lights. And I'm going to show you a few of them. Even when some of these mirabilia, these wonders, from a modern point of view are less than natural, such as, as you see here on the left, the so-called sea monk, which you see represented in Bosch as well, 
this is a fish that I don't know. But in this encyclopedic tradition, these animals were all considered to be wondrous representations, wondrous expressions of God's infinitely creative power. Even fishes and bugs with antlers. And above you see a representation of the kind of book, the kind of manuscript that contained these images that inspired Bosch in his palette of different animals. Now underlying this kind of manuscript, that on underlying this kind of book of nature, uh, sorry, underlying this notion of uh, collecting all the knowledge of the world, of the natural world in an encyclopedia with all kinds of representations of plants and animals, underlying that notion of that encyclopedia is the concept of the book of nature. That is to say the idea that nature contains the traces, the vestiges of God's creative power and is like a book parallel to the Bible, which if you read it properly, the book of nature, that can lead the reader to an understanding of its creator. So starting with the contemplation of the visible world, whether dealing with organic or inorganic nature, one could thus ascend to the contemplation of the divine. If you start with the material world, as it is created by God, you can contemplate about what is behind, what are the laws, what, is, what, are, what are the fundamental concepts that, that express themselves uh, in everything that we see around us. And if we contemplate correctly, then we start with the visible world and then we ascend to the invisible world to an understanding somehow of God. That notion was underlying all these encyclopedia. And then the question is, of course, is it also underlining Bosch's painting? Starting with the contemplation of the visible world, or the, the, the contemplation of the visible world was also called, interesting enough, speculation, to speculate. And speculate, of course, has the term, the word speculum, mirror in itself. So the, the, the creation mirrors, in a way, the laws that God maintains in, created, in, creation, in creating the world. To speculate about Bosch's painting is thus, therefore, not something you, know, you toss up an idea, it could be this, it could be that. To speculate with the Garden of Earthy Lights, starting with the Garden of Earthy Lights, if it adheres to the same concept of the book of representation of the book of nature, would therefore lead you from the vis what you see to something that you cannot immediately see. But that's a different kind of speculation than the one that we use in our normal language. So what does it mean to properly read the book of nature? Already in the Middle Ages, one of the more influential writers commenting on how to contemplate or speculate on the book of nature, Hugh of St. Victor, he cautioned that there are two ways to look at the wonders of the natural world, only one of which is appropriate. And I give a small citation. Hugh wrote, the entire world, which can be experienced through the senses, is in a sense a kind of book written by the finger of God that is created by divine power and individual beings are in a sense like figures which have been formed by divine will in order to reveal the wisdom of the invisible things of God. And thus there is no one to whom the works of God do not appear wonderful, even if the foolish only admire their outward appearance while the wise ponder the deeper thought of wisdom in all he sees from the outside as if in one and the same book, one would stress color and form of the letter, while another would praise their sense and meaning. This citation may have a bearing, I think, on how to understand the mirabilia also in the Garden of Earthly Delights. And I give you a strange, I hope, proof, or at least a suggestion of proof that I discovered thanks to the wondrous investigation infrared investigation of the Garden of Earthy Lights in the museum on behalf of the exhibition. 
Underneath the central fountain, central in the central panel, researchers of the Prado Museum recently found a hitherto unknown underdrawing that is entirely different from the ultimately painted fountain. Underneath the spherical part of the fountain, they found a bowl in the shape of a large clamshell. So. In the center of which stands a large oval-shaped object. I think you can see it. And I'd also like to ask your attention for a kind of a decoration, one, two, three that are vaguely visible. Now, based on a similarity, which maybe surprise you, with ostrich eggs that were kept as mirabilia in late medieval church treasures and private collections of secular rulers, but also in church uh, treasures, this object seems to be a huge egg. Here you have these dots that resemble these kind of things. The oversized dimensions of which are underscored by small figures sitting on the side of here they sit here on the side of this bowl. That was the original design of the fountain. The entire ensemble, from its star-like base, you can see it a little bit. That this here's a star-like base here. You see it clearly. Visible below the bowl to the turret-like shape sketch on top of the egg that all bears a striking resemblance to these reliquaries and ciboria which with ostrich eggs that were kept as wonders, as wonder objects in these ecclesiastical and private collections. The object that Bosch designed underneath what later was to become a fountain with a shape reminiscent of contemporary representations of the world as a globe. This is the final version. This underlying shape of the, uh, of the, of the, the bowl seems to uh, evoke precisely the association of a wonder object. Especially given it is very hard to see that one of the figures actually stretches out its hands to this wonder object in the original design by Bosch. This person and the person surrounding them are, in other words, admiring. They are in a gesture of admiration of the object. Many modern viewers of the painting, including scholars, want to follow this gesture, metaphorically, and embrace, at least with their eyes, the beauty of such wonder objects, like the men and, and women in the painting are also doing by viewing, touching, climbing, exploring, eating, and even, mer and even merging with these marvels. In the background, you see them literally climbing on these strange rock formations. These modern viewers maintain that regardless of the context of the Garden of Eden on the left and this hell landscape on the right, the central panel depicts a paradisiacal world that can and should be aesthetically enjoyed in and for itself. The paradisiacal environment in which these mirabilia, and just look at the many birds that you see there on the left of the central panel, the paradisiacal environment in which these mirabilia dominant dominantly figure, in other words, become a reason to turn the tradition of the book of nature on its head. Like two, that is to say, we see all kinds of pleasures in this painting, and how can thus these wonders point to God? They are just wonders to look at and to enjoy, to aesthetically embrace with our eyes, so to speak. But if we follow that interpretation, we, viewers, turn the notion of the book of nature on its head. Like we do, like these figures standing on our head. And we proclaim then that the erotic liberties 
the people in the painting are pursuing actually represent the true, natural, sinless, and thus divinely authorized state of humanity. This is not something that I'm making up. This is actually, this kind of interpretation has been proposed by, by many authors. Forget the book of nature, or in more simple terms, forget God. Now, if one's admiration goes beyond these wonders as such, we, modern viewers, think it should be directed at least at Geronimus Bosch as the author of this world, right? The author of the artistic creator, since it is he who has elaborated on these natural marvels that one can find in the bestiary and these encyclopedia, and he has applied his artistic genius, his artistic principles of invention to the creation of even more wondrous, phantasmal plants and animals, etc. If there is a god behind this paradisiacal world, it is the artist. This is at least what maybe most of us think. The question is, however, whether the world in the center of the Garden of Earthy Lights is indeed such a paradisiacal place of divine and artistic creativity after all. If one takes a closer look at these mirabilia, they show signs that indeed the traditional notion of the world as the book of nature, through which you can reach the creator, that that notion is skewed. The careful um, observer, observer may notice that interspersed in many marvels are thorns, spikes, and infesting growths that decorative as they may seem, evoke not quite paradisiacal thoughts. i just point them out to you. Spikes here, spikes there, big spikes here, and here. If, when you start looking for them, you see thorns and spikes in many places. Is that paradisiacal? Is that pointing to God? Some of the reptiles, bugs, birds, and beasts are not just monstrous in the sense of aberrations on the edge of the divine order of creation, but transgressions, and I, am not, I don't hesitate to say perversions of that divine order, such as the animals that you see here. Those belong not to regular species, they are not just wonders, they are literally and figuratively creepy wonders. The exuberant protrusions of the shiny tower-like structures surrounding the central fountain underscore the festive and decorative beauty of these constructions, yes. But there is also something frightening in the bursts of energy underlying their formation. And some of these decorative forms actually recall instruments of warfare rather than art fair. Just look at this. And then look at this. And all the other attack machine instruments represented in this engraving by Albert Duhamel, who was a contemporary of Bosch. He knew Bosch's work. The dominance of animals, of which is really a nice example, the dominance of animals over humans is often playful, but in some cases, like in this one, it's actually also painful, as you see from the gray butts of the, the gentlemen. I think they are gentlemen showing the, your, their butts which perhaps to some people may seem pleasurable, but I'm going to leave that. Some of the inversions and in general the occurrence of hybrid creatures that combine animal, plant and human forms have led art historians to draw parallels with marginalia in contemporary manuscript illuminations such as here and the notion of the world turned upside down. This is appropriate but it does not really offer a full understanding of the otherworldliness, this kind of unpleasant un otherworldliness and the erratic wild energy that is expressed in such forms as these, both 
inorganic and organic, both these wild gestures of men and also these bursts of energy in the towers at the back. Now, I think that Bosch's Haywin triptych offers a clue for capturing the essence of this force, this wild, erratic, bursting energy force, also in the Garden of Earthly Delights. According to a tradition going back to St. Augustine, the origin of evil in the world was associated with the idea that the separation of light and dark in the beginning of creation, mentioned in Genesis in the Bible, was to be understood as a reference to the rebellion of Lucifer and a host of angels against God, whereupon they were expelled from heaven. This event was traditionally represented with the figure of the archangel Michael, supported by good angels, driving out Lucifer and the bad angels down from the bright heavenly spheres and casting them in the dark pits of hell, beneath the surface of the earth. In accordance with that tradition, Bosch has represented this as a primordial event preceding the fall of Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve on the left panel. Here you see the fall of the rebel angels. They're being cast onto the world, onto the, the earth. They penetrate the earth and they start changing actually the surface, the, the, the forms of the earth. And then what follows is of course the fall of Adam and Eve itself and their expulsion from paradise. So while the rebel angels fall down, their shapes transform from angelic beings into demonic monsters with misshapen bodies, combining features of reptiles and bugs with rat-like tails and wings like insects. Boss shows how these demonic mutants fall towards the earth and penetrate its surface on land and in the seas. And there are good reasons to believe, uh, I'm thinking about these, again, strangely anthropomorphic, vaguely anthropomorphic transformations of rocks, that these strange transformations are a sign that these mutants, even before the fall of Adam and Eve, have started to infect the earth with the same deforming energy of evil. So when they fall to the earth and change the nature of the earth, the earth is not this nice, aesthetically pleasable, solid ground anymore. It's now infected from below where these devils and monsters sit. Does this have a bearing on the Garden of Earthy Delights? Here you see, by the way, clearly how these angels change their shape and, and turn into bugs and insects and penetrate the earth, conform the tradition. Now, is this relevant for the Garden of Earthy Delights? The outer rim of the earth, I'm talking about this part, here you see it more clearly. The outer rim of the earth on the exterior of the Garden of Earthly Lights shows signs that here too, already from the very beginning of creation, the world is affected and infected by an invasive force. The shores bordering the primordial waters seem to be penetrated by similar tail-like forms. Here. And the natural landscape, even before there is any sign of animal or human life, starts to show vaguely anthropomorphic shapes. Or even monster shaped rocks, bulbous growth, and tail like sprouts. So here it already starts. The transformative, deforming effect that this force has on the natural order of God's creation becomes more visible in the interior, already in Paradise Panel. Some of the mountains in the background of the left panel look like huge yawning jaws. The mouth of hell. While the animals in the foreground, in front and behind the creator, take on shapes that do not relate to any known species, but they look indeed like mutants that belong to an unearthly or perhaps below earthly order. Perhaps the creepiest manifestation of this transformative power is a vaguely anthropomorphic rock formation just behind, here on the right, 
here on the right, just behind the creation scene. Its facial features are formed by a bunch of strangely mutated bug and toad-like beasts that emerge from a pool, creep ashore, and draw the contours of a sleeping face in the rocky soil. The hairy legs of this large bug suggest the eyelashes of a closed eye. Here. Not only are these creatures the physical, and I mean these creatures here, all, all of these, not only are these creatures the physical manifestations of a deforming force that has invaded God's creation, but their crawling bodies dissolve the solid appearance of God's creation. One needs to recall the words of the psalmist, and he created and it stood fast. Nothing changed. Now, however, everything changes into a fleeting suggestion of a darkly animated earth. I have already pointed to the sprouting forms in the four tower-like rock formations in the background of the central panel. They suggest that there is a vitalistic force contained in these constructions, the true nature of which is not evident. Were it not for a giant bug-like shape that shines through and invigorates the tower on the most right. What is it actually that I see in Bosch's painting? This animated force bursts into the open in the background of the hell panel, where mountain jaws, here again you have this strange monster anthropomorphic association of the inorganic world, where these mountain jaws spit huge fire sprouts into the blackened sky. In this hell part of, this landscape, of the painting, of course, everything is subjected to the rule of Satan, who, shaped like a bird-like monster, is the very embodiment of the now all-pervasive transmutative principle as he devours human souls and defecate them in the cesspit of hell. Here he eats them, and there he produces them as fowl for hell. Now, there is still another dimension of world present in Bosch's triptych, which I can only briefly touch upon here, but which I hope to discuss in some of the later presentations uh, in this series. And that is the notion of the world of our inner landscape. The two figures that stand out in the Garden of Earthly Delights on the right and the left panels, namely the creation scene, God, uh, the creator uh, in the center, Adam and Eve, left and right, and then on the right hand, in the right panel, this huge, strange figure of the so-called tree man. These two scenes of all seem especially fit to evoke this notion of an inner landscape. This is what I just briefly want to expound to you. So the so-called tree man, here on, on your left, illustrates what goes on in the bellows of his body namely a brothel scene where devils and souls of ill repute unite. And I want to keep, ask you to keep this notion of unite, uh, of some form of erotic um, junction, keep that in mind. But what's going on in his bellows also goes on on top of his head and in his mind. What Bruegel also will, will later uh, uh, depict is whatever you see happening on top of someone's head is actually a representation of what is going on inside someone's head. The infernal landscape surrounding this strange monster, which is also very human, this infernal landscape surrounding him equally portrays the darkness of his inner world. And one can come to that conclusion if you compare Bosch's representation 
to a contemporary representation of souls suffering in hell. One among the many, many images that I have tried to find, contemporary images that I've tried to find, this is the closest to Bosch that I was able to find, a 15th century representation of hell, which is now kept in Paris. And here you actually see souls suffering in hell, and you see these strange rays sprouting from their heads. And it is as if these rays portray, almost like a film projector, <laughs> portray the mountains of their inner landscape. So what you see is a kind of combination of inner and outer landscape in one. And everything is encapsulated in this huge mouth of hell. Already in the 16th century, Bosch's art was singled out, as a matter of fact, for its ability to depict the inner life of man, the phantasmata of his imagination, his inner man's inner impulses and desires and dreams, already in the 16th century. Usually, this is understood as pertaining to the imagination of Bosch himself, that what we see in the Garden of, Lur of Earthly Delights would be a representation of Bosch's inner world, Bosch's inner landscape, of an, an inner landscape that bespeaks of a lot of threat and anxiety. But to me, it seems, and that the, especially the, the, the right panel of the Garden of Earthly Delights would, in a way, reflect Bosch's somber vision of the course of the world, that we start with creation and then mankind is created and then man, man has a lot of fun in the central panel, but we all go to hell. I think, however, that what we see in the right panel is not Bosch's inner world, but our inner world, an inner world that we share with each other, our inner landscape. And if we turn to the left panel, we see a similar aspect of inner landscape, but in a slightly different dimension. As I've tried to show also in the catalog of the exhi Bosch exhibition on, on different occasions, there are a number of motifs in Bosch's painting that evoke the notion of a dream vision. First of all, the figure of Adam in the foreground of the Paradise panel, who is depicted as having a dream vision of the future salvation of mankind. We can infer this from the way Bosch has represented the creation scene because it departs from usual depictions of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Normally, you have two options. Either you see uh, God creating Eve from the rib of Adam. Adam is sleeping. God puts Adam to sleep, and then he creates Eve from his rib. The other version that you often see is once he has created Eve, God brings Eve to Adam for what was called the institution of marriage in paradise. Because the theologians and the thinkers of the Middle Ages thought that um, marriage and the sexual intercourse between a man and women um, must have been invented by God himself, otherwise he would have given the two the same sex. So the theologians come up with the notion of the, the institution of marriage in paradise. And this is what you often see represented in, regularly represented in late medieval depictions of the creation. However, as you see, that depiction by Bosch is different. Adam does not stand, he sits. Eve is strangely kneeling a little bit, and Adam looks up very, very intensely to his creator. Now, this jump may be a little of a stretch to some of you, but it looks, if you just look at this creation scene from a formal point of view, then at least I'm struck by the fact that Adam not only sits here, but he sits in a strange way with his legs stretched out and if you look closely, the feet are crossed. And exactly there where his feet touch the feet of the creator. Which reminds you, of course, of images such as the nailing, the nailing of Christ on the cross, where you see this same figuration. More strangely, perhaps, is that if you take this scene, it looks as if not 
Adam is marrying Eve, which is usually the case in these scenes, but as if God himself, the creator, or Christ, is marrying Eve. And I just bring up this very well-known image of the Arnolfini, Jan van Eyck's Arnolfini portrait, which is considered to be a, a form of marriage depiction of the time. So does Bosch show us some strangely convoluted figured image of a kind of marriage and at the same time crucifixion? How can that be? Well, it actually can be. Because in contemporary illustrations of the Bible Moralisé, we see exactly this. That is, the sleeping figure of Adam lying and sleeping underneath the cross while Christ, or the Creator, is creating Eve from his rib. And that is paired with a representation of the crucifixion where now Christ, in, in this image, and here a monk, seems to draw, pull Eve, another Eve, from the side wound of Christ. And this, the Bible Moralisé explains, is the, the birth of the, uh, of the church. But the birth of the church is thought to be and described as a marriage. So this whole imagery depends on the notion that God, that the salvation of mankind through the suffering of Christ at the cross is a kind of compensate is the compensation for the fall of Adam and Eve and is conceived of a new unification, a marriage. And just think of the tree man who shows another type of union, of erotic union going on. I wouldn't call it marriage, in the bowels of his body. That's kind of an anti-image to this one. Finally, because I can only touch upon a few images here, there seems to be a second dream face in the left panel that endorses this notion of a dream vision. I should have said one more thing, namely that there's a long, long tradition that understands, um, that speculates about what's going on in Adam when he's being put to, to sleep by God when God creates Eve from his rib. And the standard interpretation is that he dreams, that he dreams, and then he has a dream vision of exactly this future salvation of mankind on the cross. So that would explain very, very well how Adam here literally foresees, prefigures in his body, like the crucifixion, and the creator prefigures with Eve the future union marriage of God and mankind on the cross, that this whole construction is what they call a typological construction that is a prefiguration of how God will, will save mankind for all its sins in the future. A dream vision. And I think there's actually a second dream vision in this painting. The reason why this phase two actually can be associated with Adam lies in the combination of the head and the tree that grows on top of its skull. The shape of the tree is literally taken from this book that I mentioned before, Mr. Shadel's World Chronicle, where that tree represents a tree of life. Now the combination of a single head lying below the tree, the tree of life recalls, as you see here on the right, traditional, the tra traditional iconography of Adam's skull lying below the cross on Mount Golgotha, where Adam sleeps the sleep of death until he's being resurrected by Christ. It is therefore as if we see in the left panel two manners of Adam having a dream vision. Adam, as he was created by God in his pristine shape, he has an illuminating vision of the future salvation of mankind, and another Adamic, Adam-like skull who represents the sleeping state of mankind, another kind of dream-like state that is not illuminating, but is blurred. This, it seems to me, is clearly represented by this sleepy kind of sleepy eye, 
that is so characteristic for this rock face. The face is actually turned to this fountain. And before I get here, let's go back. A fountain that has strangely, again, anthropomorphic shapes. You have the belly. On top of the belly, you have this strange construction which shows a slight a grin looking at you. Normally, in representations of the um, creation of Adam and Eve, that scene is combined with a representation of the fountain of life. However, if you look carefully, you see here an owl sitting in the center as it attracts other birds, which is a standard representation, a sim symbolic representation of the devil tempting birds, that is, souls. So we are looking here not at a fountain of life, but at a fountain of death. And this fountain of death is, so to speak, the, the counterpart for this sleeping face. And therefore, we have a strange opposition between the scene that I tried to explain and this combination. Adam looks at Christ, illuminated vision. The old Adam, in his death-like sleep, looks, looks or sleeps with a sleepy eye, is directed at, seems to be fascinated as the other birds, by the shape of this fountain of life, which is actually the fountain of death. And I think that if you want to have a good understanding of a fundamental structure of the Garden of Earth, it lights in all its duality. This is why I brought up this image on the right. It is as if this relationship is almost like al visual algebra. This scene as it relates to that scene is like this scene as it relates to this scene including the homology, the sameness of form that these images work with. Now, I'm almost coming to a conclusion. When we zoom out from this detail and oversee the entire interior triptych, it seems, if this interpretation is correct, that if, if we look at the back of this Adam, uh, Adamic skull, it seems as if it opens up at the back to the entire imagery on the central panel, as if this entire scenery is, so to speak, as much inside the skull's head as the entire landscape is, in a way, inside our heads. A final word on this notion of dream. Also in view of the fact that several scholars have connected the central panel to the imagery of the Romans of the Rose and other dream narratives of the period. The Romans of the Rose, which actually tells you the story, is a secular dream tale that tells you the story of an amant who is seeking to pluck the rose of his beloved. Now, th that dream narrative and others of the time, they typically follow a recurring scenario. The protagonist falls asleep and dreams that he is taking a stroll in the landscape where he falls asleep and has a dream vision of a beautiful garden or a mysterious forest to which he's being, being attracted by the song of birds and where he's being taught about the secrets of courtly love in all its facets. After which the dreamer awakes and narrates to whoever wants to hear it about what has happened in the I form. Now, if you listen carefully, you have noticed perhaps that I talked about the dream within the dream. The dreamer falls asleep, goes on strolling, and falls asleep. That's the general structure of these dream narratives, dream within the dream. So the dream within the dream and the interior mirrorness of these narratives stimulate the interpretive inclination of the audience, of course. Draw them into the narrative, loosen their sense of distinction of what is real and what is dream and thus have them start dreaming in the act of interpretation. And I would like to under, underline these words that interpreting Bosch's Garden of Earthy Lights is dreaming. That you cannot really make a distinction between your rational impulse of interpretation and the act of dreaming that you are automatically pulled into the dream that you're automatically pulled into when you just look at Bosch's painting. And I think it is a highly significant motif 
here in the foreground. I hope you can see it. That um, where you see a small red berry that a man is holding up while looking at the viewer. His mouth is opened, but the position of his hand and the implied suggestion of consumption are directed at you, at the viewer. It is precisely this ambivalence that cut across the aesthetic border of the picture and makes the viewer a participant of what you see in the painting, a participant in all the acts, including the erotic ones, the, and the eating of fruit and the erotic activities. It, if you will, forgive me the, the language, it sucks you into the painting. So that you too share in the consumption and consummation of love. We can conclude, I think, that Bosch's representation of the world actually entails a multiverse of world notions. It represents both the material world surrounding us, the visible world, but it also shows a dream world, an internal dream world. It shows us the world as created by God, but also the world transmuted, perverted by evil. The cosmological makeup of this pictorial multiverse pays tribute to, but also, but also goes far beyond traditional cosmography. One may call it, using a, an anachronistic term, four-dimensional. Bosch's world is, if you will, four-dimensional. It is horizontal as a depiction of the visible world. It is vertical in its orientation to the heavenly world, as well as the infernal world below the earth. And it is also mentally oriented. It is a representation of a mental world, that is to say, of paradise as mankind, the descendants of Adam and Eve, you and me, dream for ourselves. Viewers of Bosch's work were, and I think still are, led to a kind of speculative dream interpretation within the state of dreaming in which you find yourself by sheer looking at the Garner Firthy lights. Thank you.